This is Histories and Mysteries. I'm Ashley. I'm Jessica. And on this week's episode, Ashley is going to be talking about a listener requested story. It's the story of Michelle Anderson. Um, I think she's the baddie, right? Yes. Yeah. And it's a really awful case. It involves children. Yes. So trigger warning, content yes. warning. And since we're in spooky season, I am going to be talking about Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Ooh, I'm excited. Is it super haunted? It's one of the most haunted sanatoriums. Ooh. It's really interesting. And they, yeah, there's, yeah, I will get into it. <laughs> yeah, so I would like to... um yell at the person that suggested this <laughs> no it's it's a really interesting story um it's just like like you said there's um some kid death involved which is pretty awful um i try not to get too in depth with that but they did and it was horrible yeah i um she had recommended it a little over a year ago so i decided that i was gonna finally just dive into it and then I was like, this is too much. Ashley, you should do it. <laughs> and I was like, but okay. <laughs> I didn't get very far in the research, though. So, like, it's not, it's okay. not, like, I don't know what happens. Yeah. Well, and um, I had never heard of this, which is, I mean, surprising because it's, it's a pretty horrific case that usually, you know, you would hear all over the news and stuff. And maybe it was, I mean, it was back in 2007, so. I was in high school. I was in college. I graduated high school in 2004. So I think I was starting high school in 2007. You, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, okay. Okay. (laughs) I'm going to stop procrastinating and get into this. So I got my sources from a website called, uh, or it's kind of like a, it's a website, but it's also kind of like a blog. It's called Talk Murder With Me. Okay. Uh, USA Today, Fox 13 Seattle, and the Seattle Washington Times. Amazing. The Seattle Washington Times pissed me off, though, because it's one of those things where you only get to view articles so many times and then you have to pay for it. Ugh. So I needed, like, one more piece of information from that article, and I had used up my thing. And I was like, dang it. That's so, so frustrating. I hate I when they do that because I it's know. like, why? I know. I know. Why? So. All right. Christmas Eve, 2007. Oh. In a rural town 25 miles east of Seattle, something happened that would forever change this small town of Carnation. And when I say small town, I mean small town. One source, and I I tried to find this somewhere else and I couldn't find it. I just don't know that I can believe this. That one source said that the whole town is 1.2 square miles. That's so small. What? It's like a little hamlet. <laughs> yeah. So that's what it said. And it said it had a population of about 2,100 people. Um, which for 1.2 square miles, I don't. <laughs> think there's any way that could be but you know what no you decide like maybe, for yourself, listeners <laughs> maybe if the people didn't live in homes yeah like apartments or something yeah or they were just outdoor nature people there's <laughs> <laughs> a whole town of people living in tents. i just <laughs> i just like i can't imagine that a place that small would be able to house people yeah in their houses, you know yeah yeah so i th- i feel like maybe that was a mistake but i put it in here because it was funny yeah <laughs> <laughs> perfect <laughs> anyway so one such family that lived in this town was the anderson family and this town was mainly comprised of farmers um and the anderson family was no different Um, Judy Anderson and Wayne Anderson had been married for 31 years. Um, yeah, they had three children, Mary, Scott, and Michelle. Now in the story, we'll hear a lot about Scott and Michelle. I guess, fuck Mary. She's like not in here. So, oh, it's like, uh, what was it? Um, 
Eliza, Angelica, and Peggy. Yeah. It's just the forgotten. <laughs> yeah. Which I guess for her was good because she didn't get murdered. So. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, so Scott was married to a woman named Erica, and they had two children, Olivia and Nathan. And um, they were both under the age of five. So they were really, they were little guys. Aww. Yeah. Uh, Michelle had a live-in boyfriend named Joseph, and they lived together in a trailer on the 10 acres of land that um, Michelle's parents, Judy and Wayne, owned. Okay. Um, Pause. Yes. What was that, like the 1.2 square miles? The town of Carnation. 1.2 square miles in acres. 768 acres. Okay. Well, I mean, if each person, well, no, because if they had 10 acres of land right there, they owned half the town. <laughs> so it cannot be 1.2 no, square miles. Because it's 768 acres in 1.2 square miles. I know. I was, I was making a joke. <laughs> oh. But if they have 10 acres, that's like a lot <laughs> of that 700, you figure. Because if it had 2,100 people, each people each person or family or whatever would have to have like less than an acre. But then here's this family having 10. So yeah, some people can have less than an acre. Well, yeah, but I mean like the entire city would have to have almost, almost the entire city would have to have less than an acre. And then this family had 10. Yeah. But if you had like four people in a house. Yeah. Right. Four to five people. It's not like one person per square mile. True, true, true. I don't know. I still don't believe it. But anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. So they lived on the same land that Judy and um, Wayne lived on for free. I might Amazing. add. Amazing. For free. And then I wrote in here and I guess Mary was just doing Mary stuff. Um, <laughs> so Christmas Eve 2007 was supposed to be just like any other Christmas for the family. They were all getting together at Judy and Wayne's house for a nice Christmas afternoon Judy was wrapping presents for her grandchildren who were showing up soon, which like same Judy, I wait to the last minute to wrap things too. And research. And research <laughs> and everything in my life. Um, and Wayne was on the couch watching TV before the chaos that, you know, big family coming over brings uh, would commence. So it was a wonderful after afternoon with family and fun and Christmas and, you know, all that nice cozy stuff. In walked Michelle and her boyfriend, Joseph. So at this point, it's just Judy and Wayne. Um, Scott and his family haven't gotten there yet. So Michelle and Joseph walk in out of nowhere, each armed with a handgun. <gasps> Michelle went right up and tried to shoot Judy, but her gun jammed. So Joseph shot Judy and Wayne <gasps> before they even had time to react. Yeah. Yeah. So Michelle and Joseph dragged Judy and Wayne's body outside behind their shed so that when Scott and his family showed up, it wouldn't look bad. There's they, no blood. They cleaned up the room. Yeah, okay. And they sat waiting for oh. Scott and Erica to come with their two children, who again were five and three. They waited mm -hmm. for an hour. And Scott's family finally showed up. They let themselves in. You know, it's their mom and dad's house. They just let themselves in. And they started to, like, sit down and get comfy and, like, you know, get the kids ready and unpacked and all that kind of stuff. And just kind of waiting for their mom or dad to come down from, like, whatever room they were in at the time that they assumed, you know. When all of a sudden, Michelle and Joseph came into the room and Michelle Scott shot Scott four times. Why? You'll find out. Oh, okay. So, uh, trigger warning. This is when the children die. So, um, skip ahead 30 seconds to a minute if you don't want to hear that. Erica called 911 about 5 p.m. And you can hear her scream, not the kids, before the phone went dead. After that, Erica was shot twice. Apparently, by that point, Michelle had run out of bullets. So, she told Joseph he'd have to shoot the kids. 
Okay. Joseph, Can I skip ahead? <laughs> <laughs> Joseph did as he was told, and he shot the five-year-old and the three-year-old. Um, I have this later on, but I'm just going to get this, rip this bandaid off. They found, um, and I can't remember which one, either the five-year-old or the three-year-old, um, cowering behind their mom's body dead. So, like... Mm-hmm. The kid ran behind the mom's body after she was shot where he, where the kid was shot. And I can't imagine what those poor kids went through. So Michelle, assuming the police would come, locked the front gate to her parents' property. And this blows my mind, Jessica. When the police did show up because of that 911 call, they couldn't enter the gate because it was locked. So they decided to turn around and leave. What? Yeah. They're like, oh, the gate's locked. No big deal. Bye. Um, Not that they would have been able to do anything at this point. I mean, everybody was dead, but still. So the family lay dead in that house through Christmas Eve and Christmas Day until December 26th when Judy's coworker and best friend Linda was worried when Judy didn't show up for work that day. Uh, She was so worried that she left work at 8 a.m. to go check on Judy. When she got to the house, she noticed that the gate was locked. So, Jessica, do you know what she did? She fucking opened it, climbed over it, climbed around it, went yep. through it. Yep, she got out of her car and just walked around it. <clears throat> uh, she knocked, but no one answered. So she tried the door, and it opened. Oh, no. Just ahead, she saw Scott's body laying on the floor. She said at first her brain went to, like, oh, they got carbon monoxide poisoning because, you know, you wouldn't first go to their murdered. Mm -hmm. But then she saw the gunshot wounds in the blood. Um, A little further in were the bodies of Erica um, and her kids. But Linda said she didn't have her cell phone with her. So she ran to Judy in Wayne's room and called 911. And she said that she didn't look closely at the female body. And so she just assumed it was Judy, even though it was Erica. Um. And so she called 911. She told them that the baby, because at this time she only saw three-year-old Nathan. So she told them that the baby, Scott, and Judy were shot and lying there. Um, Apparently she was on the phone with 911 for 30 minutes. Um, And she did tell them that Judy and Wayne's daughter lived on the property too. And she knew that Michelle had been mad at Judy and Wayne over some money dispute. And that she was scared because if Michelle did have something to do with it, she could still be like closer in the house. And so like Linda was scared to be there. She said, quote, the gate is locked, which makes me wonder if her daughter did it, which is scary because then I might be up here with a murderer. Around 930 a.m. police arrived on scene. They found Scott, Erica and Nathan right away. And then, like I said, they found the five year old body huddled behind her mom. All of them had been shot in the head and police began looking around the house and the property for evidence. And that's when they found the bodies of Judy and Wayne behind their shed. A little after three hours, police, uh, a little after three hours that police had arrived on scene, um, Michelle and Joseph just pulled up like, Hey, um, they said that neither of the two of them seemed too phased by the police being there. And they didn't ask if Judy and Wayne were okay or really anything else. So the police were, like, immediately suspicious of them. Good. Police started asking them questions, like, where they were. Michelle told them that they were on their way to Las Vegas to get married. And then they got lost. (laughs) So they turned around to come home. Which, (laughs) worst alibi I've ever heard in my life. Um, (laughs) She also told the police that the last time she had seen her parents was on Christmas Eve. Which, I mean, she wasn't lying. That was the last time she saw them. Then the police said, Michelle, because they um, took her into the station for questioning. And they said, Michelle, why do you think you're here? Why do you think we are here? Why do you think the police are here? And she broke down crying. And she said, it's not Joe's fault. It's all my fault. As soon as I shot the gun, I felt so bad for what the hell I have done. I'm a monster. So why did you keep going? So that's my... I just like spit real hardcore on my <laughs> pop filter. Um, that's my thing throughout this whole thing. So 
when Michelle starts talking in court and stuff like that, it's like, I, I have that in here a couple of times. Like, I don't believe a word she says. So, uh, so the police asked her and I asked her in my head, well, why'd you kill the kids? And she said, because they would have been scarred for life after seeing what happened to their parents. So like, maybe don't kill their parents. But like, okay. The thing is though, is that she had killed the grandparents first. Mm-hmm. Right. So if she felt bad. Waited an hour. Literally. Yeah. Like they were behind the house. They wouldn't have known that it was them. Yep. Like yep. they're behind the shed. Sorry. But like, really? Yep. If you felt bad after the first shot, that means that you would have felt bad after your mother died and your father died. Let alone to shoot two kids. Yeah. Yeah. I 100% agree. <sighs> Um, and then police said, why, why did you kill your whole family? And she said, quote, I'm tired of everybody stepping on me. Again, that doesn't sound like anybody that has remorse for what they did. No. And like children are stepping on you. Yeah. She said that her brother owed her about $40,000 that he wouldn't pay back. And her parents were starting to press her about paying rent after she lived for a year there for free how old is this woman uh in her 20s or 30s i think yeah you should be paying rent you trash monkey i know i know and so she like this is what she killed her whole family over they think um so police asked her how long she had been planning this and she said two weeks she had two weeks to change her mind and my thought is, okay, if you're mad at your brother because he owes you $40,000 and he won't pay you back, couldn't you have some point got him alone and shot just him and not his wife and kids? Mm-hmm. That, again, to me, does not show remorse or like someone that feels bad for what they did. They had two weeks to think about it. Yeah. Uh, so her confession went on for almost two hours. And at the end, both Joseph and Michelle were arrested. Michelle also led police to where they had stashed their guns in the Stillaguamish River. Let's say that's how you say it. Nailed it. <laughs> they were each charged with six counts of aggravated murder. And in June of 2008, Michelle was doing an interview with the Seattle Times. And she said, I want the most severe punishment, which would be the death penalty. I think if I kill a bunch of people, I'm not sure I deserve to live. I want to waive my trial. Which, again, I think is just bullshit so that she can look remorseful so that she can hopefully not get the death penalty. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I have a whole paragraph in here. I honestly don't buy this. Like, you thought about this for two weeks, waiting for Scott and family and murdered little kids. Like, there's so much time to feel things. And if you feel this badly about it, at some point you think you'd change your mind. So I went off on a little tangent there, but... <laughs> Well, and just like like you said earlier, just lure Scott somewhere. Like, yeah. ask him for coffee or something. Bring him for a drive. Shoot him in your car. Like, yeah. I mean, I am not advocating for like, murdering Scott, yes. but yes, no, I see what you're saying. But honestly, like, don't like if that's the person you have beef with. Why do you have to kill everybody else? Right, and exactly. And she said the only reason why she murdered the kids is because of what they saw. She was afraid they'd be scarred for life. So don't scar them for life. Yeah. yeah. Oops. See, I'm getting all worked up on this case. I'm hitting things. I'm spitting. <laughs> all right. So in October of 2008, prosecutor Dan Satterberg said he was going to go for the death penalty. But a judge ruled against it, said he couldn't go for the death penalty. And the governor of Washington had said that no one would be executed while he was in office. So it wasn't really mm. an option for them, which I've talked a bit about on here the death penalty and how i feel about it but like i also really hate this bitch so um (laughs) (laughs) they took this to the supreme court who overturned it um the first judge's ruling and said that the prosecution could seek the death penalty which again i'm not for the death penalty but i don't see how a judge can stop it if your state allows it you know what i'm saying yeah like don't shoot children (laughs) yeah true So both Joseph and Michelle um, were to be tried separately, and Joseph was first. 
His trial began on January 20th, 2015, and his defense was that he was mentally ill and had been coerced by Michelle into committing this crime. Now, they didn't, I couldn't really find too much that goes into like his mental state, but I did, I did watch some of his trial um, because he gets up and testifies, and I did watch some of him testifying. And he doesn't look or sound like completely there. So I don't, I don't see this as a far reach for him. I just, I think it's funny though, that Michelle was saying, oh, it's all me. It's all me. And then he just throws her under the bus. (laughs) I didn't even think about that, but yeah, I love that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, all he was the one that shot the most people though. He was. Right, like he shot both parents and he shot whoever else he shot. Everybody else but Scott. Michelle only shot Scott. Yeah, and he, yeah, because he shot the kids too. Uh huh. Yeah. So he was described as emotionless through most of the trial, but when he took the stand, things changed. Mm, Of course they did. Apparently, he was extremely heavily medicated with anti anxiety and antidepressant. So he was very like erratic on the stand. Also, apparently he had a speech impediment, which um, didn't really help in, you know, also being heavily medicated. Um, But he was, quote, barely able to string sentences together, sentences together. He started laughing at one point, not like, not like this is funny to me laughing, kind of like a, I don't understand laugh. It was weird. Um, And he described the look on judy's face when he shot her and as he was describing this he put his arms in his hands um his arms over his head and started to rock back and forth um he said he did it because he thought he had to he said it's not a good excuse but he's not trying to make an excuse for himself he's just trying to explain his actions so Defense said that he had a mental illness that allowed Michelle to completely control him. Someone kind of um, uh, compared it to like a cult leader controlling Mm -hmm. people. So I don't know. They didn't really get much more into his mental stability or kind of where he was in that case. Um, I don't know if he really was or if this was just an elaborate defense to get him out of stuff. I I don't know, but take it take it as you will. So he said, again, he killed the kids specifically to save them from a life of hell after seeing what had just happened to their parents, and he believed that they would be reincarnated. He went on to describe his abusive childhood and his many suicide attempts. He also spoke briefly about spirit animals for some reason. (laughs) Okay. What was his spirit animal? Uh, They didn't say. Probably like something stupid. like Snake? Yeah. I like that i was gonna say gopher but i actually like gophers so no they're so cute they're so cute i don't know why that was the first animal that came to my head Rude. <laughs> uh at one point he said quote you know what fuck it if you want to kill me go ahead kill me i don't care um the defense also told the jury that michelle anderson i'm sorry the prosecution oh wait No, sorry, defense told the jury that Michelle Anderson could not load the guns. So McEnroe did it for her. McEnroe also brought extra bullets. Oh, no, this is prosecution. I'm sorry. I wrote the wrong thing in here and then I confused myself. So this is prosecution saying this. So they said, I think we've established none of these murders would have happened without you, said prosecution. And he said, unfortunately, that is completely true. Yes. Well, yeah, because, like, her gun jammed, right? Mm -hmm. So, and he was the one that shot the first bullet. Yep. So, I think, too, that if if her gun had jammed and they didn't have another person there, the dad probably could have overpowered her. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, So, apparently, in Washington, to get the death penalty, it has to be a unanimous from the jurors. Every single one of them has to vote for the death penalty. So on May 13th, 2015, with a jury in favor of eight to four for death, 
Joseph was sentenced to life in prison because it was there was four people that didn't want death penalty. Yeah. Pam Mantle, who was Erica's mother, so Scott's wife's mom, said he has no respect for anybody. He had no respect for the two people that were the kindest to him, which were Wayne and Judy, who took him in and he shot them and threw them in the backyard. I have nothing to say about him. God, I can't imagine. Poor Pam. She lost her daughter, her son-in-law, and her two grandkids. Mm -hmm. So... Because Joseph's verdict, um, prosecution decided to take death off the table for Michelle and go ahead with just life in prison. Um, he said, they said that basically they didn't think it would be a care. Uh, it would be a miscarriage of justice if she got the death penalty and he didn't because he did basically most of the killings, even though she was obviously the mastermind, they just didn't feel like that would be right. So they took that mm -hmm. off the table. So her trial began on January 25th, 2016. Prosecution said that the motive for these murders is pure, unadulterated greed, referring to an interview Anderson had with the detective and when she brought up money more than 35 times in her explanation as to why she killed her family. Wow. Michelle flipped back and forth between blaming herself and calling herself a monster and a bad person and um, to then putting the blame on her family. And then she started to say that they had all abused her for years, which I don't buy. She said, quote, I wasted my life because of these assholes. It's not fair. So, again, that does not sound like someone who feels remorse to me. No. At one point during her trial, Michelle yelled at the judge. So she got called up and he said, do you want to testify in your defense? Because I guess she was having some issues with her lawyers. And instead of saying yes or no, she started freaking out, um, saying that she was going to file charges against her attorneys. Um, they were court appointed because she couldn't afford her own um, because she felt that they were lying to her. She told the judge she wanted to temporarily leave jail to find her own lawyer. Mm -hmm. But the judge was like, uh, no. And she said that he was violating her rights. Oh, was he now? But <laughs> in her defense, which I don't like to do. Um, her lawyers did not call a single witness to the stand. And they said that she was extremely difficult and wouldn't cooperate or communicate with them at all. But there's not always a witness. True. True. Right? Like maybe they there wasn't maybe there maybe weren't any just, witnesses. Yeah, she's just like a horrible person and they couldn't find any like even character witnesses for her. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Right. So needless to say, on March 4th, 2016, Michelle was found guilty on six accounts of aggravated murder in the first degree and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. I always hate that it takes so long. So long. Like that was what, nine years? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, you know, they're going to have appeals and everything. So they probably won't get their final sentence for several more years. Yeah. Um, Pam Mantle, Erica's mom again, addressed Anderson and said, I don't think you're big and tough, Michelle. I think you're a bully and a coward. I am brokenhearted every day. I miss those six people. Um, Michelle's sister, Mary, who finally shows up, uh, <laughs> did say to Michelle, it kills me. I loved you so much. Just know that they loved you. Yeah. And um, so this was 2016. So both her and um, Joseph are obviously still in prison to this day. And that is the story of Michelle Anderson, the horrible, horrible bitch lady. I hated that. Yeah, it was awful. Thanks, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> hey now, we love Robin. <laughs> we do love Robin. We do. That was a it was a good story. I had the one that I had never heard of. It was just awful. <laughs> awful. Okay, so let's uh Let's uh, change gears here and get <laughs> Yeah. Instead so, of sad and depressing. Yeah. No, this is a, uh, I've been wanting to do this for a really long time and it's been on my list since we started the podcast. So I am looking forward to bringing it to you. Yay, I'm very excited. And you, you don't know anything about it? I don't. I don't. Oh, that's so weird. So I feel like I've heard the name, but I don't know if I'm just confusing that with the Witches of Waverly Place, which I really liked. <laughs> it was a good show. <laughs> so I don't know if that's um, where I'm hearing Waverly and that's where my brain is going for the familiarity or maybe. if I have heard of it. I don't know. Zach, Zach Baggins went there. 
Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll just start. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> Waverly Hills Sanatorium. The site was bought by Major Thomas H. Hayes in 1883. Major Hayes made the decision to run a one-room schoolhouse for his daughters on the site after building his family home. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, tuberculosis, often referred to as the White Death, devastated America. Can you imagine, sorry to cut you off already, but can you imagine seeing this? Can you imagine having a house so big that eventually it can become like a sanatorium? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that insane? That is. And like you can have a schoolhouse. And yeah. Like, oh my gosh. This horrible and highly contagious disease, for which there was no cure at the time, claimed entire families and occasionally entire towns. Wow. Louisville, Kentucky had the highest death rate from the tuberculosis in the U.S. in 1900. To be more specific, TB caused around 25% of all deaths in the entirety of the United States by the end of the 1800s. Wow. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Built on low swamp land, the region was the ideal breeding grounds for sickness. Therefore, in 1910, a hospital in southern Jefferson County was built on a windswept hill that had been intended to fight the terrible disease. Hmm. A new hospital was eventually established in 1924, thanks to contributions of money and land, and the sickness spread rapidly throughout the area. Fantastic. <laughs> Lovely. Two years later, in 1926, the brand new building known as Waverly Hills was inaugurated. Even though it was known as the most sophisticated tuberculosis hospital in the nation, the majority of the patients still died from the illness. Hmm. At this point, however, it could now hold more patients, so it was being able to hold over 400 people. Wow. Yeah. Since there was no medication available at the time to treat the illness, many patients were encouraged to rest, get plenty of fresh air, and eat well-balanced meals. Sadly, the hospital's primary function was to isolate patients who had the disease and keep them separate from others who did not. Wait, why were there people there that didn't have it? What do you mean? I thought it was like a tuberculosis hospital. Was it just like a regular hospital? No, it was a tuberculosis hospital. So basically, the patients that had tuberculosis were isolated from their friends and family. Oh, I got you. I'm sorry. I was thinking within the hospital, they were isolating people. Okay, that makes sense. I'm caught up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so parents and even children were coerced into the sanatorium with little to no contact with their loved ones, severely severing families. Mm. And that's probably, I mean... You know, they say recovery is a lot of times mental as well. And so being separated from your family. Yeah. Oh, poor things. Sometimes tuberculosis treatments were just as harmful as the illness itself. By today's standards, some of the experiments performed in pursuit of a cure seem brutal, while others are already standard procedure. Oh, wow. To limit the spread of bacteria, UV light was shown on the patient's lungs. This was done in sun chambers, which replaced natural sunshine with artificial light or on the hospital's roof or open porches. So like tanning beds. Yeah. <laughs> Patients were frequently positioned in front of enormous windows or on the open porches, regardless of the season. Oh. As fresh air was regarded to be a potential treatment. In the past, patients may have seen may have been seen relaxing in chairs and enjoying the outdoors despite being completely coated in snow. I, yeah, at first I was thinking, oh, that sounds nice. And then you said all seasons. And I was like, that doesn't sound nice. <laughs> oh, no, completely coated in snow. Oh, that's awful. Which I don't know how people would think that would be. That was okay. Idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like this seems like it's a good idea, even though everybody yeah. hates it. <laughs> Well, let's just give them hypothermia. Yeah. <laughs> Other procedures were far bloodier and less pleasant. The lungs would be... Oh, this is the worst part. <laughs> the lungs would be surgically implanted with balloons that would later be inflated to expand them. Okay. It 
goes without saying that this frequently resulted in catastrophe. Blew up the lungs. As did a procedure where ribs and muscles were removed from a patient's chest to allow the lungs to expand further and take in more oxygen. I mean, Many- I get what their thought is there and not like knowing what we know now. I can see where they would come up with that. Yeah, for sure. Many patients did not survive this last resort <clears throat> surgery. And that was just absolutely drenched in blood, obviously. Yeah. Many patients left Waverly Hills through what became known as the body shoot. While those who both survived the illness and the treatments did so through the front entrance. The hospital was connected via an enclosed tunnel for the deceased to the railroad tracks at the base of the hill. The remains were secretly lowered to the waiting trains 500 feet away using a mechanized rail and cable system. This was done so that the hospital's patients wouldn't notice how many were being transported out as corpses. Yeah, that's probably for the best. And making them believe that the treatments were working and people were just leaving. Oh, that's not good. Well... I don't know. I mean, I can see it because I'm sure they weren't doing it for this reason. But again, with recovery, like you do have to have hope. You can't just give up, you know. And well, and that's the thing. They were more concerned about their mental well-being. That's what I was wondering if if they were concerned with the mental well-being, or if it was more like they just didn't want people to know how their stuff isn't working. No, they were really concerned about how their patients were feeling. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah. This tunnel was also quite morbidly used to bring supplies in beyond what they produced on the land themselves. During World War II, it was used as an air raid shelter for the staff and the patients. Regarding the number of deaths throughout Waverly Hills, decades of operation, there are numerous unreliable reports obviously yeah (laughs) some people said that thousands of people perished inside the hospital walls but this assertion is highly exaggerated the most fatalities that occurred at waverly hills in a calendar year was around 132 people okay well i'd like to say that's not horrible but like also they had 400 people there so that's you know a quarter of the population yeah dying every year and that information came from a former assistant medical director oh so i'd like to think that that was accurate enough yeah but in the scheme of like instead of thousands it's nice that it's just yeah yeah for sure you know but yeah when you put it into perspective that it houses 400 people so yeah yeah with data extending all the way back to the first hospital records from 1911 those numbers had fallen to as few as 42 deaths by 1955 oh wow and it has been estimated based on death certificates that were submitted that there were roughly 6,000 deaths there okay in total and what was the year span on that like 19 when did uh, uh, 1910. Okay. Was when the hospital was built. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it says here the first hospital records were from 1911. Gotcha. So. It's a huge number of deaths to have happened in one structure, even though it falls far short of the figures mentioned in the tales. Yeah. (laughs) Tuberculosis had started to wane by the late 1930s throughout the world. American microbiologist Albert Israel Schatz created the antibiotic streptomycin in 1943, which was incredibly successful in treating tuberculosis. Good for him. Yes. The revolutionary drug drastically reduced the number of tuberculosis patients in the country, rendering Waverly Hills Sanatorium and other tuberculosis treatments facilities obsolete. After World War II, there was a little increase in new cases, and Waverly Hills served as a housing facility for many soldiers returning from the conflict. 
In his autobiography, Dr. Stewart reported that many of the troops had conditions that were so severe that they died within a week of being admitted to the hospital. Oh, wow. Waverly Hales was shut down in 1961, but reopened as Woodhaven Geriatric Sanitarium the following year. Throughout the time the structure served as an elderly residence, there have been numerous rumors and tales spread regarding patient abuse and strange experiments. Oh, God. Unfortunately, some of them have turned out to be untrue, while others have been shown to be real. Oh, no. The use of electroshock therapy, which was formerly thought to be quite effective, was used for treating a wide range of illnesses. Budget cuts in the 1960s and 1970s, which I think we discussed in a previous episode, Mm -hmm. um, resulted in appalling conditions and patient mistreatment, and the state finally decided to close the hospital permanently in 1982. Is it surprising that Waverly Hills is regarded as one of the most haunted places in the nation with all the death, suffering, and torment that took place within these walls? Yeah. Over the course of the following two decades, the land and buildings were sold at auction and frequently changed hands. The site was bought by a developer in 1983 with the intention of converting it into a minimum security jail for the state of Kentucky. After objections from the neighborhood, the plans were scrapped and a new plan to convert the old hospital into apartments was developed. Oh. The concept was shelved due to a lack of funding, though. Oh, good. I would not want to live in those apartments. Oh, I was going to say, that would have been so cool. Yeah. I would get haunted. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And probably not by a nice person. Oh, you never know. They were all nice people there. Yeah, but they're probably pissed. Oh, probably. (laughs) I mean, they thought it was working. They thought that they were getting mostly good treatment. Yeah, but then when they die, they know they weren't. So I guess. (laughs) Robert Albert Haskey, the executive director of Christ the Redeemer Foundation Incorporated, purchased Waverly Hills and the adjacent area in March 1996. On the Waverly site, he intended to build an art and worship center as part of the top as <laughs> as well as the tallest statue of Jesus in the entire world. Oh wow. The famous Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro served as the model for the 4 million dollar statue which was intended to be placed on the hospital's roof. The next stage of the strategy involved spending an additional $8 million to turn the sanatorium into a church, theater, and gift store. Unsurprisingly, (laughs) the initiative received significantly less funding than was anticipated. And how much money do you think was raised? So they needed... Eight plus four, so like twelve. Yeah, twelve million. I bet they got one point two million. Three thousand dollars. Oh shit! <laughs> was raised over the first year. Oh no! <laughs> and the project was abandoned in December nineteen ninety seven. Albert Haskey abandoned the Waverly Hills property and then attempted to have the site condemned so that the structures might de- might be demolished and redeveloped in order to recuperate part of his costs. After the county objected to the idea, demolition activity allegedly took place around the building's southern side in an effort to weaken the structural foundations and collect insurance money. Hmm. Due to the failure of this plan, Charlie and Tina Mattingly, Mattingly, I don't know, uh, the present owners of the land purchased Waverly Hills in 2001. By 2001, the once stout structure had all but been destroyed by the passage of time, the elements, and thrill-seeking vandals. The neighborhood's haunted house, Waverly Hills, attracted both youth who broke into the basically a bunch of youth broke into the sanatorium looking for ghosts youth and the destitute were seeking shelter so 
The hospital quickly gained a reputation for being haunted and rumors of resident ghosts like the young girl who was allegedly seen running up and down the third floor solarium, a young boy who was allegedly seen playing with a leather ball, the hearse that was rumored to have appeared in the building's back and was delivering coffins, the woman with the bleeding wrists who cried for help, and others started to circulate. Visitors reported hearing unusual noises, seeing lights in the windows as if there was still power flowing through the structure, and hearing spooky footsteps in darkened rooms. Other urban legends spoke of a man in a white coat observed entering the kitchen and the occasionally pervasive aroma of preparing food. Mm. The kitchen was a complete mess, full with puddles of water and debris from a leaky roof, damaged windows, fallen plaster, broken tables and chairs, and not much better had happened in the cafeteria. Nevertheless, a number of witnesses claimed to have heard footsteps in the room, a door closing on its own, and the aroma of freshly baked bread. Weird. The fifth level of the structure was linked to perhaps Waverly Hills' most famous and disputed story. Ooh. Two nurses' stations, a pantry, a linen room, a medicine room, and two medium-sized rooms on either side of the two nurses' stations made up this floor of the old hospital. Almost everyone who had entered Waverly Hills over the years was curious about one of these. Room 502, which is the subject of several myths and legends. Here, people have reportedly seen things moving in the windows heard voices that didn't belong to them and if the lore is to be believed have even jumped to their deaths oh gosh there are many urban legends regarding what went on in this area of the hospital but the main one was that there was a floor where tuberculosis patients who were mentally sick were housed this wasn't the situation (laughs) here the patients weren't insane and they weren't locked in their rooms They had the same freedom to move about as other hospital patients on all other floors did. The layout of this floor allowed patients to still enjoy the sunshine and fresh air, which were thought to be curative or at the very least prolong the lives of those who were ill. The rumors state that a nurse was discovered lifeless in room 502 in 1928. Mm. She had hanged herself from the lamp fixture as an act of suicide. Oh, gosh. At the time of her death, she was single, 29 years old, and pregnant. Oh, She died of suicide as a result of her depression about this circumstance. Yeah, poor thing. Before her body was found, it's unclear how long she may have been left hanging in this chamber. (gasps) There would also be other tragedies involving room 502. Another nurse who worked in the same area in 1932 died by suicide by jumping off the roof patio and landing several stories below. Although no one appears to understand why she would have done this, many have theorized that she might have been forced over the edge. Although although there are no records to support it, tales about this still circulate. Oh, gosh. There are no documents to support any of this happening in reality. Just like with any other tale, (laughs) (laughs) conflicting stories exist regarding how the woman was able to hang herself. Some claim she did it from the lamp fixture, while others claim she used a pipe above the entrance or the rafters. The pipe over the entrance, though, was a component of a sprinkler system that was built in 1972. Mm. And remember, she died in 1928. Okay, so it couldn't have been that. (laughs) No. There are also no rafters, and the light fixture is suspended from a thin decorative chain that cannot support a person's weight. The tale of room 502 may have been loosely based on some lost facts, but the truth is still hidden beneath all the rumors and conjecture. Strange events yet persisted in being reported. Volunteers working on the building's restoration over the course of the following year reported hearing ghostly noises, hearing doors slam, seeing lights appear in the building when there shouldn't have been any, having objects thrown at them, being hit by apparitions in doorways and corridors and so much more. Oh, so apparently there's this little boy that likes to play with his ball. So he'll 
like kind of roll it for you Aww. and people have reported seeing like dark figures in doorways mm-hmm. and it's supposedly been caught on camera uh-huh. but yeah super creepy yeah I feel like I rushed through that but it's just so creepy that is really creepy I love that Thanks. Yeah. So that was my story. Um, I got my sources from American Hauntings, Courier Journal, Travel Channel, and the Haunted Places. Oh. Yeah, but, that sounds I mean, adding on the T V patients that died and the World War II soldiers, and then if it's true what they did to the senior citizens that live there, like I can see why that place is so freaking haunted. Yeah. And it's huge. Like, take a look at it. Um, There used to be, like, tours and stuff. Mm -hmm. But currently, right now, the current owners are in a legal battle. Oh. I'm not really... I don't really remember why, because I researched this, like, two weeks ago, and I didn't think it was (laughs) as important to mention. But um, it looked like there were some Halloween events, but then I found, like, a very recent article from, like, this month or something that said they were in the midst of legal battles, so... Okay. I think it's to do with the historical society or something. Probably. So it's the Waverly Hills Sanitarium in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. It is huge. Mm-hmm. That's ginormous. Wow. That's crazy. Let's go. Let's go. Let's see. They got their website. 2022 haunted house tour tickets. Oh, cool. Uh, you have to arrive 15 minutes early, Jessica. Okay. Uh, and I think they do like private tours too and like nighttime tours. Oh, like I nighttime think. investigation tours. Yeah, I would think they have to, right? Like that's... I would love to do that. Um, I would probably get haunted. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just say that you don't believe and you don't claim the negative energy. <laughs> They'd be like, I don't care what you claim or don't claim. Fuck you. <laughs> You're haunted. <laughs> they do have a six-hour public investigation that you can do. See? It's a semi-guided event geared towards the novice or newbie investigator. Oh, I would love that so much. Let's do it. They have a private investigation. Ooh. And it's a, they say, very, in all caps, semi-guided event. Oh. Ugh. Anyways. yeah that's great i have a joke for you oh perfect because i don't have any tell me the joke i only have one okay what do you call a whale without underpants i don't know what a free willy <laughs> i haven't seen that movie in years i should watch that again yeah that was such a good movie did you end up watching the new Hocus Pocus? I did. What were your thoughts? It's cute. Um, I I want to say it's not as good as the first one, but I don't know if that's more just like nostalgia. You know what I mean? Yeah. I but think it's it, cute. I think it was cute for what it was. Yeah. I thought the little girls in the beginning weren't as like they weren't great oh i thought they were so good uh, they were so I cute that they were just like too over the top okay and like i thought like they played the roles well but at the same yeah. time i just it was just too cheese ball for me gotcha okay um and i thought it would have been like really cute if they brought back like max and allison at least yeah and that the main girl was like their daughter or something like yeah I that would have been really cute yeah but we just don't see them. Yeah, we don't see any of the original like, characters or the Sanderson sisters. Yeah. I know. That was a little disappointing. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure that the original actors said that they would come back. Yeah. I think there was something going on behind the scenes that they didn't. I don't know. I've seen like a lot of different mentions of it, but I liked it for what it was. You know what I mean? Yeah. For what it was, it was cute. Yeah. Have you started watching on Netflix the Midnight Club? No. It's, it's pretty good. It's made by the people that made um the haunting on or the haunting on Hill House. Okay. And Midnight Mass. Oh, okay. I didn't see Midnight Mass. Oh, Midnight Mass was so good. Was it? Yeah, it was really, really good. And this one's pretty good too. This one's more youthful. 
So, I mean, take it again for what it is, but it's got some pretty good scares mm-hmm. in there. I, I like it. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if you want more TV suggestions from us, <laughs> lovely ladies, you can find and us- horrible stories. <laughs> <laughs> you can find us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Yeah, and if you'd like to rate and review us, we would really, really appreciate it. Yay. Um, you can do so on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, next week is our Halloween episode. Yay. So, we're gonna cheat a little bit we're sorry <laughs> well it's not cheating i think it's a i think it's a cool i think we're doing some cool all right we're, we're gonna you guys tell you decide. some ghost stories so we're excited <laughs> yeah so. all right well we look forward to bringing you a two new stories next week bye, bye.